and I heard him flick his bick. And then I heard <laughs> like the singeing of hair, you know, and I looked over and I could just see him and the, and the, the, the flame was up really high and he, and he went like, <laughs> and then he went, <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this fantabulous episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Poetry Podcast. Today, I have for you a gift. And it, it, it's cool because it's, it's fucking Christmas, okay? I have a gift for you. And this gift is a conversation with Michael Malone, who has a new book out called Pinball Wizard that is about his travails at trying to live what the the government called a bohemian lifestyle while working for the Department of Defense and being friends with one Charles Bukowski. So um, we had an amazing talk. Um, he is such a cool fucking dude. And I can't wait for you guys to hear what he has to say. So I'm going to keep this short. Okay. Um, there's not really a whole lot new. There actually is, but I'm going to save that shit. And just so you know, like he was in the Born Into This documentary um, on Bukowski, which is why I put that clip in the beginning. And um, I'll probably put another clip in it right now she learned a strategy for dealing with him and i saw that evolve over the years where at a certain point she would just uh he would be baiting her and and i could see he was trying to get this response he was trying to get the fire going and he wanted to get the fight going you know and linda would just just sit there and clench her teeth and i could see her her jaw clenching and uh she would say that's right papa you're right you are absolutely right. And she would just agree with everything he said. And then he would just sigh and, and just kind of growl <laughs> because he was so angry because you just can't fight with yourself, you know? And, and she just wouldn't do it. Yeah. And then we'll be on with the schlow. I was listening to an interview you did and you said you belong to a meditation church. And I do out of just out of my own curiosity. I was curious about that. Yeah. Well, it's called self-realization fellowship and mm -hmm. it's in Pacific Palisades. And it's really just um, uh, the founder Paramahansa Yogananda called it the church of all religions. So basically he wanted to take, uh, you know, the balkanization of religion out of it and just focus on uh, uh you know techniques that can get you to some place of transcendence let's say you know and that and get rid of the religious dogma and just go right to meditating and getting to a place that sort of connects you with something bigger yeah so that's really what it's about yeah H have you heard of that uh, self-realization uh, fellowship i have not heard of that actual like... yeah there are many uh you know there are many orders that do yeah. similar things yeah but it's uh it's kind of a non-religious religion in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that how long have you been a part of it uh i've been doing that for a long time uh about 40 years uh and you know what's interesting is at the end of his life bukowski was into meditating yeah um yeah yeah his, his wife linda brought a TM transcendental meditation teacher over to the house and um, he took to it he really did when he when he was dying from uh, leukemia it was um it was useful it was something he found to be good now I know the girl you were with at the time was working for Linda is that who you're still with today or uh I'm not uh that was Jan Curry. And uh, after she and I broke up, she married Ramla Jack Elliott. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was uh, 
He was the guy in Greenwich Village that introduced Dylan to Woody Guthrie. Oh, shit. So, yeah, so Ramla Jack is kind of a big deal in the history of folk music in New York. Yeah. And she married Ramla Jack. And then she drank a lot of booze and died before she was 50 from alcoholism. Mm. Yeah, Jan was working for Linda Lee Bailey at the Dew Drop Inn in South, South Redondo Beach. Um, and that's how I met Bukowski. But I, I already knew about Bukowski because yeah. when I was in high school, I was reading um, Notes of a Dirty Old Man in the L.A. Free Press. And uh, so I was I was kind of already into him. And I and I and I felt like I it would be good for me to meet him because I had it in my head that I wanted to write. I hadn't really written anything. I mean, I dabbled a little bit, but it, none of it was any good. But uh, I just sort of felt like if I could meet Bukowski, it might something might happen, you know, something yeah. might click, Pretty and right. um, and it and it kind of did because uh, I wrote some short stories. And Bukowski read them and he, he liked them a lot and told me to send them to Larry Flint, and Flint um, bought two of them for five hundred bucks each, which I you know this is a long time ago. Yeah, and yeah. even today, 500 would be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So Bukowski said, he said, listen, kid, don't use my name. You have to do it on your own. And uh, so, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't make any calls. And he didn't even want me to mention that he had suggested that I do it. But I sent the stuff in and uh, they bought it. So do you feel like that was the best writing advice he gave you? Uh, well, yeah, you know, one time I published a short story in Wired magazine that, you know, really hit pretty big and, um, and it was optioned for screen rights. And so I went to Bukowski's when that was happening and I just sat down with him and I asked him what he thought because, uh, a big New York agent was sniffing around and wanted to represent me. And so Bukowski said, uh, he paused and he, he said, listen, kid, uh, if you want to write, you're going to write and you'd better write it your way, because if you're after money or fame or groupies, he said, then you'll do it their way and they will smash you down into a flattened turd. Uh, and then he just paused and kind of looked at me and then he said, ring the bells of the city. The old man has spoken. Which uh, which cracked me up because he was just kind of like riffing on his own uh, heaviness, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was good, but but what he really was saying essentially is that don't try to please some kind of idea of a public. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't don't think like, oh, you need to write this, you need to write that. Uh, he really was saying, be true to your own artistic vision, you know, like that has to be what you're really doing, you know, something that comes from your interior. And uh, I think that was really important advice. Yeah, that yeah. is really good. Yeah, yeah, it on, was good. On top of that, because I mean, it's not like, you've been a slouch you've been doing all sorts of shit this whole fucking time so like what advice since most of the people who like watch this are young writers or new writers and stuff like that yeah what is your best advice to give somebody i think you really have to this is funny while i was in college i remember i used to um you know crack a tall beer and light a cigarette and put on headphones and you know i had a manual typewriter and i'd sit there and kind of rock out drink and smoke and write and and you know bukowski could kind of get away with that <laughs> but you know i mean he kind of did that that's kind of how he operated but yeah. for me i reached a point where i thought you know if i'm gonna write anything that's any good got to really work a lot harder than I've been working, you know? I mean, for me, this is a hard thing, you know? I mean, it's not something that just, it comes easily, you know? I mean, it's, um, 
I was friends with a famous New Yorker short story writer named Tom Jones, T-H-O-M Jones. And and he said, every time I write a short story, I feel like it's like it's carved like a few years off of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I don't know if I'd go that far, but but I think it, it's really hard. And, you, and you've got to work and you've got to revise and you've got to read it out loud, because I think reading things out loud, sometimes when I'm preparing to do a reading and even stuff that I've had published, I start monkeying around with it because. As I read it out loud, I think, fuck, you know, that could be better. <laughs> you know, like I, I have a hard time letting go of editing, you know, because I feel like sometimes I'll look some, at something it's, and it's already published. And I go, shit, you know, that could have been better right there, you know. But I think that impulse to, to refine your stuff is really important. I mean, I think you have to, you have to work, you know, you have to work on it. And um, and I think you do get something also from dealing with this is harder to do today, but from dealing with editors in publications. I mean, sometimes editors are bullshit, honestly. I mean, sometimes they they give you, you know, there's editorial pushback that is is not useful. But some some editorial interactions that you have with people, you actually learn from. that. I mean, mm -hmm. you can, you know. Even if it's like an online publication or something, somebody might say, well, you know, you know, there's a back and forth. And that, that can be a, a process that is useful. Yeah. Yeah. So since this, since your book, Pinball Wizard, um, is loosely based on stuff that happened, I believe you said in 1981. Yeah, Did, that's right. Is, 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 uh, is your um like wanting to revise and revise and revise the reason why it took so long? <laughs> yeah, why did why did it take forty fucking years to get this thing out the door? <laughs> well, see, the thing is, I I didn't I didn't write it right away. You yeah, know? like uh, so, I I started fucking around with it like about. 10 years ago, but I was busy doing a lot of other shit, you know, and I kept putting it aside. And, um, but, but, you know, something interesting happened with this and I'll tell you how it was published. So on, on Facebook, I have 5,000 friends and I have a lot of, and I've been posting short shorts and I've been posting pieces of this for years, you know, just like, uh, and, and and I and I was kind of trying to ball it all up and get it like into a unified whole. Uh, so I was working on that over a period of a few years. But I started publishing pieces of it. And this German publisher named Roland Edelman, he's in Dortmund, I think, or Dusseldorf or something. I can't remember. But he but he saw some of the stuff and he was interested in it. And then he got. Sagun Schnabel, uh, a translator, and she translated the manuscript, and then he published it uh, in 2000, um, 2022. So it came out in Germany in an English and German translation. And then, but he didn't want to do it in America. He didn't want to deal with that. So he suggested I find a, a U.S.-based publisher to get it done over here, which I found a guy in San Francisco, Brooks Rodden at IFSF Publishing in up north, and he put it out for the U.S. market. So posting those short pieces on Facebook, um, it was useful for a number of different reasons. Um, you get a sense of how some kind of public is reacting to yeah. the work, you know, so you get some immediate feedback that way. And uh, and then it also came to the attention of some people by doing that. Mm -hmm. so, well, you said you started it 10 years ago. Um, for me, like I know a lot of especially like novellas or novels those things kind of percolate in your brain for years and years and years. Yeah, that's right. Start laying it down. So when did you know that you wanted to like tell this story like this? 
I'd say that I knew I wanted to do it like this about 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, but I, like I said, I was busy doing a lot of other stuff. And, uh, and so it was just kind of off and on and off and on that I was. So, uh, um, why don't you tell us the premise of the book right now to keep, to bring everyone up to speed on this? Yeah. Well, uh, Pinball Wizard is a as a novella, but as we've talked about, it was inspired by this real time in my life when uh, my parents were going through this really nasty divorce, and I just started to travel overseas for my job as a software guy, supporting uh, Top Gun fighter pilots in the Department of Defense, and also it was the at the time when I had just met Bukowski and started hanging around at, at, at his house. And I had a new girlfriend, Jan, who was a major drinker and drugger, which was kind of putting my clearances, my top secret clearances in jeopardy. Yeah. And so I thought if I could put all of these elements together in one ball, it would be a compelling coming of age type story. And, um, and my readers tell me that it is, and it worked that way. Uh, now, I called it a novella instead of a memoir because I didn't want to be held to the absolute rigorous truth Definitely. of, uh, of you know, like that there was no embellishment because there is some embellishment in this. But I would say it's about 96% true, actually. I mean, you know, it really is. I mean, almost everything. And the Bukowski material in here, is absolutely as I remember it. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't fuck with the Bukowski stuff. There's one scene in the book where I fly in an F-111 fighter bomber and I hurt and and nearly crash. And that's a true story that was told to me by one of the pilots. But in the book, I'm in the jet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the Air Force would never let a guy, a software geek, go up in one of those jets. They would just never do that. Because you'd have to be able to, you know, pull the ejection seat and really, shit like yeah. that. You know, I mean, so that would never happen. So, so there are a couple of things uh, that are a little in the fantasy realm, but it, it's mostly a true story, actually. So, how did you end up working for the Department of Defense? Well, uh, I was. I was working in downtown LA as an IBM mainframe assembly language program. And this is like the old machines that are as big as, you know, the, the bigger than the living room of a house. Yeah. Yeah. Huge, huge machine. And uh, so I was what's called a systems programmer doing a lot of sort of in the, in the guts of the operating system type work. And, uh, they told me because of some kind of uh, something that was going on with the budgeting of the whole city of L.A. that because I was a new guy, I was probably going to get laid off. And, you know, I had I saw an ad for the Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo. And I had always been kind of fascinated with space. And uh, when I was a kid, I built models of jets and space and, you know, boosters and all that stuff. And, and so I just... Um, I needed a job and I went over there and uh, they hired me and it was uh, and then they started very quickly sending me on trips to uh, Osan, Korea, uh, Ramstein, Germany, um, RAF Lakenheath and Mildenhall and the Midlands of England. And, um, you know, so it was it was interesting, but, you know, it was. I was also a little out of out of sorts with what it was all about <laughs> because i'll tell you one story that and this is actually in the book one of the pilots was showing me the cockpit of the jet and there was this fluorescent orange tab hanging down and he asked me guess what happens if i'm flying and i pull this tab and i said no idea and he said a lead foil shroud unfurls over my head to protect me from the fireball after I deploy my nuclear ordinance. And I was just thinking, holy shit, this is not some kind of video game. 
Yeah. These guys might like these guys might, you know, start World War Three and blow up the whole fucking planet, you know. Yeah. And uh so you know so at that point I thought, wow, you know, what the hell am I doing here? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean it really was a moment of you know, where you you can kind of abs if you're doing technical work, you can kind of abstract yourself sometimes from you know, you're just focused on this thing you're trying to do and you're writing lines of code and you're working on computers, you're trying to debug software, and you're not really thinking about these big picture things. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, I was thinking, holy fuck, you know, this is like, this is the real deal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it kind of, um, kind of freaked me out. Um, and I knew I didn't, I knew I didn't want to work there for the rest of my life and I didn't, but, um, but I knew, uh, yeah. Mm. So how long were you there? Well, I was there a lot longer than I was in the book. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> in the book, it looks like I bailed out after about a year, but I was there for many years. Uh, it was, uh, it was harder to disengage from that than I would have liked maybe, but, uh, yeah. I so was there for with, years with the with the myth or legend that Bukowski was on the FBI watch list and all this stuff. Did your um, friendship with him ever like ring any alarm bells anywhere? Well, they put me in for one ultra high security clearance and I flunked it. And I still don't know why, but they told me one thing. They said, you flunked it because of your bohemian lifestyle. Oh, shit. So, yeah, that's what they said. Yeah, they said, we can't give you that. It was like one of the highest clearances. They said, we can't give you that because, you know, because of the way you're living. <laughs> and uh, and was that about Bukowski? Was it about Jan- my girlfriend, Jan Curry? Was it about, you know, uh, and I told her, you know, that you sign a document that they're going to tap your phone. I mean, you know they're going to tap your phone. They tell you they're going to tap your phone. And I told Jan, do not say anything about drugs or anything like that on the telephone. And she called up her friend Prinny and she goes, yeah, well, bring over uh, what are those little bottles of Coke? <laughs> I don't know what they are. You know, those little brown bottles. And, yeah, bring over a uh, you know blah blah, blah of Coke, you know. And then I go, oh fuck! I said, stop it! I told you not to say that, you know. So and they also they tail you. I mean, they they follow you. I yeah. mean, you know, they have unmarked cars and they're driving around seeing where you're going, you know. And and that period lasted for six months while they were investigating me. Wow. Yeah. That is wild. So what was it about? I mean, uh, John Lennon was definitely on one of those lists. I I, I heard that. Uh, Bukowski, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. The idea about are you the pinball or are you the pinball master? Okay. Yeah, pinball oh, wizard, yeah. Pinball wizard, sorry. And um, yeah. somebody asked you this, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was the, the middle of the night. I was in a nuclear hardened bunker at RAF Lakenheath in the Sussex, England, in the Midlands of England. Uh, and and my manager came in and I was, you know, having trouble and you know, he was getting pissed off. When are you going to get this working? And then he then he looks at me and goes, are you the pinball or the pinball wizard? Are you the pinball wizard or the pinball? And, uh, you know, that's kind of a driving theme in the book, because I think the protagonist, Ralph Hargraves, based on me, is um, he's trying to figure out like what he's trying to figure out what kind of life he wants to lead, basically. I mean, that's that's really what what the big theme of the book is, is like trying to figure out you know, do I want to be this kind of person? Do I want to be an artist? Do I want to be some Joe Schmo in the defense industry? Do I want to, you know, it's like, I mean, it's a certain time in a lot of people's lives where they're trying to, trying to figure out who they are, you know, Mm -hmm. like where, what kind of life they could leave, what lead, where they'd be comfortable with, 
you know, that path and where is that path going to take you? So, so are you the pinball wizard or the pinball? Are you taking charge of your life or are you just being bing, 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 bing? Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's one of the basic questions that the book uh, deals with. So knowing that um, it's very semi-autobiographical, when do you think you decided to answer that question for yourself? Well, that's that's a probing question. That's a really good question. Um, I think the answer to that question evolved over time. It wasn't just like a light went on, you know, where you go, bing. Uh, I think it took some time to slowly kind of evolve out of the defense stuff. And I continued to do computer consulting for Sun Microsystems and some other companies and i did i also wrote tech journalism uh and i and that stuff was interesting i mean i didn't i didn't hate that so i was always kind of doing a, a dual thing you know i was doing computer stuff and certain kinds of consulting i was always interested in writing i mean i, I when i was 16 years old i i read a interview in playboy magazine with kurt vonnegut and i oh. remember it yeah, and I remember that Kurt Vonnegut interview, and I was just thinking, wow, that guy's cool. I wonder if I could do something like that. You know, it's just kind of, I, I mean, I had that thought in my head from an early time where I, I thought that was something I wanted to do. But as I told you earlier, I reached a point where I'd been fucking around just typing shit, and it really wasn't worth anything. And that was the point where I thought, I've really got to get... If I'm going to do anything that's that anybody's ever going to recognize or think is worth a shit, I've got to really buckle down and and get it going and and work it, you know, work it a lot harder. Yeah, Vonnegut completely changed my life. Like, I was always trying to, um, I don't know. I feel like I was always trying to overwrite before I yeah. found it, and then when. Like I read Breakfast of Champions, I felt like <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's like the most. I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah it's just like <laughs> I have the asshole tattoo on my finger, so when I flip people, oh up, yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's yeah, just, like I don't know. Like he wrote so plainly, but so hard. Like there was so yeah. much. In, yeah in his satire and him talking to me like i'm a fucking child and i'm yeah. like yeah that's exactly how you need to fucking talk to people you yeah know? Like, I, it you, just... you're, you're so right about breakfast of champions because it's uh you know when he was writing things like uh sirens of titan which mm -hmm. i loved but but breakfast of champions it's just like boom he, 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 it's just like a, a, a whole new thing you know and 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 it's so uh it, it's it looks really simple in a way but mm -hmm. it's really hard to do something like that you know especially yeah. all of the intertangling um stories from all the different characters like all converging um at the right one of that you know it's like it's an art and he killed it and yeah that's kind of like to me like the I mean it changed my life but it's also like the high water mark like if you're going to do something aim for that <laughs> you know like yeah yeah I, like that I, I totally agree with that yeah but it's also funny that you were a kid when you read this interview with him and it was in a playboy magazine we totally skipped over that like what were you doing <laughs> with playboy as a kid <laughs> well see my neighbor my neighbor Ricky Staley's father built this plywood shed in the backyard. It was just kind of with like bunk beds and stuff. It was just kind of like a hangout for for the kids, you know, for a few guys in the neighborhood to hang out. So they wouldn't be in the house, you know, they'd be in this shed in the back. And uh, Staley would go to the local liquor store and there were these cheesy uh, skin mags like Nugget and Dude and <laughs> all kinds of shit like that. So Staley would just steal all this shit from the liquor store, and then we'd bring it back, uh, occasionally Playboy, yeah. And so that's how we uh, 
you know, that's how he had that stuff. And also the L.A. Free Press, I told you, which had notes of a dirty old man in it by Bukowski. So yeah, it was uh, all Staley's. It was all Staley's backyard shed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Every good shed back in the day had a stack of pornos in them. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kids today don't know how fucking easy they got it. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of that, so here's, um, I don't know if you can see this, but oh, yeah. uh, th this is um, one of the stories that Bukowski told me to send to Larry Flint. And you can oh, see oh. this, uh, you can see this Larry Flint iconic kind of artwork they do for their stories. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, cruising. <laughs> Yeah, this was, uh, what year was this? July 1991. But I remember I was with my father in West L.A. My father was a college professor in the USC School of Business. We walked past a, uh, a, a newsstand, and I saw this. This is Larry Flint's so-called high-end magazine, Chic, and I told my dad, hey, check this out. I opened it up. It says, fiction by Michael Malone. My father said, oh, God, couldn't you use the, couldn't you have used a nom de plume? <laughs> I said, hey, Dad, I'm published. Give me a fucking break, man. That's awesome. Yeah. So do you think, because um, I feel like a lot of people who cover Bukowski or talk about Bukowski talk way more about the myth of Bukowski instead of the actual work that he did in his actual life. Do you think there's like, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about him? Um, yeah, I'll tell you, uh, I have a good answer for that. A lot of people think that Bukowski just, you know, that he just, I mean, that it, he just sat around and drank and knocked out all this work and then, but mostly just partied and drank. Uh, but Bukowski was a really hardworking guy. Mm -hmm. He had tremendous discipline. I mean, people don't get that. He was answering correspondence from people. People he didn't even know would send him shit to read. And he would read a lot of it and write them letters back. And uh, he was really a, a supporter of aspiring writers and artists. And, uh, and he would... Um, he he worked his butt off. I mean, he really did. He worked hard. I mean, people think now. I mean, he did go on these benders, you know, for like, you know, get drunk for I don't know. It, it kind of knocked him out for a couple of days. But then he'd go for like three or four days, and he was just cranking, you know, just writing and sending things out to small publications. He was always sending, even even when he was famous, he was sending out poet and poems to. Uh, small publications, all kinds of stuff. He was really just turning the crank every day. Yeah. One time he told me, yeah, he said, he said, uh, he said, I'm just like a spider, man. He said, it's, I, it's in my DNA to pound this typer every day. He said, I'm building that web every day, just, just pounding it, pounding it. It's in my DNA. It's just, it's, it's what I got to do. So I, I think people, I think people don't really understand how hard he worked. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. They they don't really get that 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 he was he was very disciplined. I mean, he really was. Uh, this, you know, all that that bookshelf of books that's like that wide, that didn't just happen. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought about it like. I'm like, okay, so he was writing basically up until his death. And yeah. you took all of the stories of him drinking and whoring and fucking and doing the whole thing. And you added all those days up. Like at most, you would have about three months worth of him actually partying really hard every day. And then if you look at the rest of that, like he had to have been working. Yeah. He, no, you he, he like, was the majority of his life was at the fucking typer. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
he was he was working a lot. But um, I remember Linda. Linda was off somewhere visiting her mother in the east or something, and he invited me over. And it was just the two of us, and and we did kind of pull an all nighter <laughs> drinking wine. I had one of the most god awful hangovers in my entire life, and he told me, he said, "Listen, kid." I sleep late, so when I wake up, you'd better be gone. <laughs> and I and I woke up. Uh, it was horrible, but but we had a good time. I mean, mm -hmm. We really did, yeah. So um, you know, it was uh, there was there was there was a fair amount of drinking. <laughs> there was, yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, that's not. And uh, well, let me just read a short thing to you. And this gives you a sense of how he and Linda would would fight, <laughs> and and you know they never they never like assaulted each other physically. They really never did that. But boy, they they did some real who's afraid of Virginia Wolf style like <laughs> going at each other. So so we're at the house. I, I'm there with Jan, and it's. It's Hank and Linda Lee Bailey, who was living there at the time, and she later married him. So Linda, before she met Hank, she was kind of a little bit in the in the rock scene. You know, she says she lived for a summer with David Crosby on his yacht in Miami Harbor. And she also knew Pete Townsend of The Who. Uh, so Bukowski and I were drinking on the couch. And Linda and Jan were talking, and Linda mentioned something about flying on a private jet with uh, Pete Townsend. And uh, then Bukowski cut his eye over and said, bragging again about your days as a rock and roll hooker. And, uh, so this set off like a, an argument between the two of them. And finally, Linda came back with, um, uh, you th this, is, this is directly from Pinball Wizard, actually. Uh, you think every woman is a whore. You hate women. Admit it, said Linda. That's why you're so obsessed with pussy and cock and all that down and dirty shit. You can't look at a woman in the eye and relate to her as a human being. All you see is fishnet stockings, tits, and a hole. You're starting to piss me off, Bogaski replied. If it wasn't for me, I don't know what the fuck you'd be doing. That shitty little restaurant would be out of business in a week. What would you do if you had to go out and get a real job? I guess you could make Slurpees at 7-Eleven or sell oranges on a freeway on-ramp. You're the kind of vile piece of shit that makes people jump off buildings or blow their brains out. You have a genius for sucking every ounce of hope and joy out of anyone around you. At least I have a genius for something. How many can even say that? You're right. I'm sure Hitler was a genius. Why don't you move out, he said. Go ahead and go. Do you think you're the only woman I can get? No, I'm well aware that the lure of fame, even second-rate fame like yours, is a powerful aphrodisiac for trailer trash women. That's it, Bukowski planted his foot underneath the wooden coffee table and kicked it over, launching glasses of wine into the air. Get out of my house. You don't live here anymore. I mean it. We're through. Bukowski and Linda stared at each other. Linda's jaw flexed rhythmically. Then he moved in close. I mean it. Leave. Spittle spewed in her face. Tears streamed down her cheeks. She stood up and looked at me. Get me out of here, she said. Okay, I replied. Uh, right. And, and yeah. Uh, so they would go at each other like that, um, kind of frequently, but, and, and she did move out for a while during that period, but then they got back together and, you know, it was smoothed over, but, uh, but that blowout actually did, I think she was out of the house for a month or something, you know? Damn. Bukowski had a, um. A Fourth of July party every year, and it was just a small party. And he would invite me and my wife Kathy to that uh, every, every year. And it was really, uh, it was really a small group of people. Uh, it, for a while, he was hanging out with 
Madonna and Sean Penn and, and, and people like that. But he never invited those people to this party. This party was just for people who were kind of a different crowd. It wasn't a Hollywood party. And, uh, and, and at those parties, at the, at the Fourth of July party, it was, it was very pleasant. You know, I mean, there was no fighting. And uh, uh, so so those knockdown drag out fights were uh, they weren't frequent, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was it was really um, it was really nice uh, on those Fourth of July's because it was it was just it almost felt like family. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I felt like I was part of the family and uh, it was it was really good. Now, you said he would throw those parties every year. Um, from someone who reads his stuff, you would assume that he never liked to have parties and that if parties happened, it, they happened without his knowledge of them happening and then it just started. But was he someone who would like actually invite people over to spend time with them and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, he did invite people over. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, he didn't like big parties, you know, yeah. he didn't like a party that had like 30 people or something. No, I, I, he didn't like that. But if he had a group of people over where it was six or seven people and people were talking and you know, drinking, you know, I mean, I, I think he liked that. I yeah. know he liked it. Yeah, I know he liked it. So there was a barbecue, this, uh, uh, this guy named Rob Allen was always over a young guy. He was uh, he had been an employee of, of uh, uh, at the Dew Drop Inn of Linda's. And uh, he, he he later moved to Tokyo and became a famous. He looked kind of like Billy Idol mm -hmm. and he moved to Tokyo and became a famous uh, uh, male model over in Tokyo. Yeah. But now he's back here. But uh, so it was part of that that group. So how did you get involved in the Born Into This documentary? Linda told me that John Delahan, John Delahan wasn't, wasn't sure he was even going to make a film at first. Mm -hmm. He was just, he had hired a, a, a crew, a high, a, a professional video crew that he was paying for himself. And, and he was just going to interview people about Bukowski. So he went around and he interviewed Bono, he interviewed Sean Penn. He interviewed Harry Dean Stanton. Uh, he interviewed uh, Tom Waits and, and me and uh, a whole bunch of people that didn't even make it into the movie. I mean, th th there were probably, uh, for every person that was in the movie, there were about three or four people that were interviewed that didn't make it into the movie. But he, but he wasn't even considering at first that it was going to be a documentary. He just wanted to do it. Uh, but then he, I remember he told me he had a vision once. He, he was driving past the New Art Theater in West LA. And all of a sudden he looked up there and, and he thought, Bukowski, born into this. He just thought, I'm going to see that on that marquee. It's just like it, it entered his head. I'm going to see that, the title of this film on that marquee. And four years later, that happened. Yeah. It's wild, man. And, and, you know, what's interesting about the documentary, because for about a year after that documentary came out, young men would walk up to me on the street and say, dude, you're in that movie. <laughs> I was really surprised when that started happening. I mean, it doesn't happen anymore because it was 20 years ago and I don't look like that anymore. But, uh, but for about one year, yeah. uh, about every couple of weeks, some young guy, always a guy about 27 years old or something. He'd be, I'd see some guy kind of looking at me and they, yeah, yeah, that's you, right? <laughs> you were in it. I go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and also Bukowski was not like really greedy, you know? I mean, I think he was at a certain point, he was kind of getting off on having his black BMW and his lap pool and his jacuzzi and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, but, you know, he liked it, but. It wasn't like he thought, oh, I want to move to Bel Air you know, yeah. or I want to I want to move to Beverly Hills. You know, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't that was not ever in his head. You know, so speaking about all of this, when um, Barbe came in and wanted to do the movie and everything like that, um, 
what was there any changes or any um like weirdness about the whole idea of going Hollywood more so than anything that he had spoken about? You're talking about Barfly when yeah. you mentioned Barbe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there was a really interesting anecdote about, uh, about Barfly, which is when, when that project was first brewing up, uh, Sean told Bukowski that, uh, the the first idea was that Sean would play Bukowski in the movie. Uh, but then Sean said, I I didn't hear this from Sean, but uh, Linda or Bukowski told me this. I can't remember which. But that Sean said the only way he would do it is if his friend Dennis Hopper directed it. And mm -hmm. so that would mean that Bukowski had to cut cut out Barbet and he had already promised Barbet that because Barbet had already done a lot of work trying to shop it around and, and get people to, but every every time Barbet would uh, every time Barbet would uh, give some uh, director or producer the script, they they say I hate this script, but so they didn't like the script. Actually, it was yeah. really it was a hard sell. It was really hard to sell it, but. Um, but then Sean walked away from it because uh, Bukowski wouldn't let go of because he again Bukowski was very loyal to Frank yeah. so so he had already told Barbet had already been involved in it and he wasn't willing to just say you're out you know so so then Sean walked away and that's when they got Mickey Rourke mm -hmm. but uh, yeah so I thought it I thought it worked out pretty well actually. Yeah. People could find your book it um, on Amazon, right? And it, it yeah, does. yeah. Well, you have to you have to make sure you know how to spell my name. So it's uh, M E L O A N, Michael M E L O A N. Because if you just put in Pinball Wizard, a bunch of other stuff comes up. So yeah, it is on Amazon. It's also in bookstores. I mean. You know, you can actually get it at Barnes and Noble if you order it. I, I don't yeah. think they carry it, but um, uh, so yeah, Pinball Wizard, Michael M E L O A N on Amazon. And you said you're working on a script for it, right? Yeah, I, the script is done, and uh, my I have uh, Charles Barrett is uh, Hollywood Book Promotions. I'm working with him, and we're uh, it's been well. I think Sean Penn has received a copy of the script. We haven't heard anything from him yet. Yeah. Uh, and we've got some other ideas for Bukowski's, you know, uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people out there who I think could do a really good Bukowski. Mm -hmm. Who do you think? Maybe. Uh, yeah, we had a whole list. Um, just recently, just recently when I watched the Oppenheimer movie, I saw Gary Oldman playing, president truman and i thought god that gary oldman guy can do fucking anything yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. and yeah. i was thinking i would he might be a really interesting bukowski gary yeah. oldman you know? yeah, yeah. that sounds amazing and is there any like way that people can get into contact with you if they want yeah, yeah, just via email. Uh, it's m d m e l o a n at gmail dot com. M d m e l o a n gmail dot com. Cool. Well, right on. I mean, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but um... well, this was really fun, man. I mean, uh, I I really oh, enjoyed oh, it. I dug it so much, man. Anytime, yeah. anytime you ever want to just like talk shit, like hit me up, and I'll like hit record. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, this is great. All Thanks right. a lot, Matt. Awesome. All right, everybody. That was my talk with Michael. It was great. If you want to get the book Pinball Wizard, which you should fucking do, the link is down below. Okay, whether you're listening to this on a podcast feed or you're watching this on YouTube, link will be down below. Um, show Michael some love. And when you're done with that, if you want to get my latest chat book, fuck you, not fuck you, it's the name of the book if you're just listening. Um, I only have, there's only 20 of these. 
and the first nine are signed, and you can only get them as of right now by emailing me and telling me you want it. So do that or um, suck a dick because that's the only way you can get those. I got a bunch of um, books. I did a big unboxing and got a bunch of books from like um, Lithic Press and um, Jack Mueller and Neely Tchaikovsky, a, a ton of shit. So if you're interested in seeing that unboxing, go to my YouTube page and look up uh, whatever it was called, probably Mail Hall Unboxing or something like that. But yeah, and if you have any questions or comments or wanna fucking yell at me, you can send me an email at IHateMountWall at gmail.com. Uh, sign up for the Anarchy Crew, um, and do member stuff. Oh, and I was going to say too, um, I'm starting to put like outtakes of, um, podcast episodes and interviews I've done up for the members on, uh, my YouTube channel. So if you want more, um, stuff, like there's a little bit more with Michael here and there's also a ton of stuff I'm going to be posting from all the other, um, interviews and stuff that I've done, um, over the last hundred plus episodes so those will start appearing up in the members feed as well um, um since this has been a bukowski centric episode too um the first part of war all the time the read through that we've been doing for the bukowski book club is up on the members feed now um so that would actually be part two of um the war all the time sitch all right, so I'm going to shut the fuck up now, type hard, everybody, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.